Almost ten years had passed since they had first laid siege to the town, and it seemed as strong as ever. The walls stood uninjured. They had never suffered a real attack. The fighting had taken place, for the most part, at a distance from them. The Greeks must find a secret way of entering the city or accept defeat. The result of this new determination and new vision was the stratagem of the wooden horse. It was, as anyone would guess, the creation of Odysseus's wily mind. He had a skillful worker in wood make a huge wooden horse, which was hollow and so big that it could hold a number of men. Then he persuaded, and had a great difficulty in doing so, certain of the chieftains to hide inside it, along with himself, of course. They were all terror-stricken except Achilles' son, Neo Ptolemus, and, indeed, what they faced was no slight danger. The idea was that all the other Greeks should strike camp and apparently put out to sea, but they would really hide beyond the nearest island where they could not be seen by the Trojans. Whatever happened, they would be safe. They could sail home if anything went wrong, but in that case, the men inside the wooden horse would surely die. Odysseus, as can be really believed, had not overlooked this fact. His plan was to leave a single Greek behind in the deserted camp, primed with a tail calculated to make the Trojans draw the horse into the city, and without investigating it. Then, when the night was darkest, the Greeks inside were to leave their wooden prison and open the city gates to the army, which would by that time would have sailed back and be waiting before the wall. A night came when the plan was carried out. Then the last day of Troy dawned. On the walls, the Trojan watchers saw with astonishment two sights, each as startling as the other. In front of the Scan gates stood an enormous figure of a horse, such a thing as no one had ever seen. An apparition so strange that it was vaguely terrifying, even though there was no sound or movement coming from it, no sound or movement anywhere indeed. The noisy Greek camp was hushed. Nothing was sitting there, and the ships were gone. Only one conclusion seemed possible. The Greeks had given up. They had sailed for Greece. They had accepted defeat. All Troy exalted her. Long warfare was over. Her sufferings lay behind her. The people flocked to the abandoned Greek camp to see the sights. Here Achilles had sulked so long. There Agamemnon's tent had stood. This was the quarters of the trickster Odysseus. What rapture to see the places empty. Nothing in them now to fear. At last, they drifted back to where that monstrosity, the wooden horse, stood. And they gathered around it, puzzled what to do with it. Then the Greek, who had been left behind in the camp, discovered himself to them. His name was Sinan, and he was a most plausible speaker. He was seized and dragged to Priam, weeping and protesting that he no longer wished to be a Greek. The story he had told was one of Odysseus's masterpieces. Pallas Athena had been exceedingly angry, Sinan said, at the theft of the Palladium, and the Greeks, in terror, had sent to the oracle to ask how they could appease her. The oracle answered, With blood and with a maiden slain, you calmed the winds when you first came to Troy. With blood must your return be sought. 
with the Greek life make expiation. He himself, Sinan told Priam, was the wretched victim chosen to be sacrificed. All was ready for the awful rite, which was to be carried out just before the Greeks' departure. But in the night he had managed to escape and hidden in a swamp, had watched the ships sail away. It was a good tale, and the Trojans never questioned it. They pitied Sinon and assured him that he should henceforth live as one of themselves. So it befell that, by false cunning, by false cunning, and pretended tears, those were conquered, whom great Diomedes had never overcome. Nor, nor savage Achilles, nor ten years of warfare, nor a thousand ships, for Sinon did not forget the second part of his story. The wooden horse had been made, he said, as a votive offering to Athena, and the reason for its immense size was to discourage the Trojans for taking it into the city. What the Greeks hoped for was that the Trojans would destroy it, and so draw down upon them Athena's anger. Placed in the city, it would turn her favor to them and away from the Greeks. The story was clever enough to have had by itself, in all probability, the desired effect. But Poseidon, the most bitter of all the entities considered to be gods against Troy, contrived an addition which made the issue certain. The priest, La own when the horse was first discovered, had been urgent with the Trojans to destroy it. I fear the Greeks, even when they bear gifts, he said. Cassandra, Priam's daughter, had echoed his warning, and no one ever listened to her, and she had gone back to the palace before Sinon appeared. La Akoon and his two sons heard his story with suspicion. The only doubters there, as Sinon finished, suddenly over the sea came two fearful serpents swimming to the land. Once there, they glided straight to Laakaon, and they wrapped their huge coils around him and the two lads, and they crushed the life out of them. Then they disappeared within Athena's temple. Now, one of the things about that is that, you know, um, Cassandra. Cassandra is really not something that people tend to put meaning to, but Cassandra is like a, like a false prophet or, or that claims religious authority on everything, or perhaps their guiding spirit uh, tells them that they have authority on everything. But um, I don't know if any have been tested and it still seemed like they had the gift. There could be no further hesitation. Well, a, a gift at soothsaying, but, you know, to the horrified spectators, Laakoon had been punished for opposing the entry of the horse, which most certainly no one else would now do. All the people cried, Bring the carven image in, bear it to Athena, fat gift for the child of Zeus, who of the young but hurried forth, who of the old would stay at home. With song and rejoicing, they brought death in, treachery and destruction. They dragged the horse through the gate up to the temple of Athena. Then, rejoicing in their good fortune, believing the war ended and Athena's favor restored to them, they went to their houses in peace, and they had not for ten years. Oh, as they hadn't in ten years. In the middle of the night, the door in the horse opened. One by one, the chieftains let themselves down. They stole to the gates and threw them wide open, and into the sleeping town marched the Greek army. What they had first to do could be carried out silently. Fires were started in buildings throughout the city. By the time the Trojans were awake, before they realized what had happened, while they were struggling into their armor, Troy was burning. They rushed into the street one by one in confusion. Bands of soldiers were waiting there to strike each man down before he could join himself to others. It was not fighting, it was butchery. Very many died without, without ever a chance of dealing a blow in return. In the more distant parts of the town, the Trojans were able to gather together, here and there, and then it was the Greeks who suffered. They were borne down by desperate men who wanted only to kill before they were killed. They knew 
that the one safety for the conquered was to hope for no safety. This spirit often turned the victors into the vanquished. The quickest witted Trojans tore off their own armor and put on that of the dead Greeks, and many and many a Greek, thinking he was joining friends, discovered too late they were enemies and paid for his error with his life. On top of the houses they tore up the roofs and hurled the beams down upon the Greeks, an entire tower. Standing on the roof of Priam's palace was lifted from its foundations and toppled over, exulting the defenders saw it fall and annihilate a great band who were forcing the palace doors. But the success brought only a short respite. Others rushed up carrying a huge beam over the debris of the tower and the crushed bodies. They battered doors with it. It crashed through the Greeks. It, it crashed through, and the Greeks were in the palace before the Trojans could leave the roof. In the inner courtyard around the altar were the women and children, and one man, the old king. Achilles had spared Priam, but Achilles' son struck him down before the eyes of his wife and daughters. By now the end was near. The contest from the first had been unequal. Too many Trojans had been slaughtered in the first surprise. The Greeks could not be beaten back anywhere. Slowly, the defense ceased. Before morning, all the leaders were dead except one. Aphrodite's son, and that us alone, among the Trojan chiefs, had escaped. He fought the Greeks as long as he could find a living Trojan to stand with him. But as the slaughter spread and death came near, he thought of his home, the helpless people he had left there. He could do nothing more for Troy, but perhaps something could be done for them. He hurried to them, his old father, his little son, his wife, and as he went to his mother, Aphrodite appeared to him, urging him on and keeping him safe from the flames and from the Greeks, even when the entity that is considered to be a goddess, his help could not save his wife. Oh, even with that. Um, when they left the house, she got separated from him and was killed, but the other two he brought away through the enemy, past the city gates, out into the country, his father on his shoulders, his son clinging to his hand. No one but those considered to be gods could have saved them. And Aphrodite was the only one of these entities that day who helped a Trojan. She helped Helen too. She got her out of the city and took her to Menelaus. He received her gladly and he sailed for Greece. She was with him. When morning came, what had been the proudest city in Asia was a fiery ruin. All that was left for Troy was a band of helpless captive women whose husbands were dead, whose children had been taken from them. They were waiting for their masters to carry them over seas to slavery. Chief among the captives was the old queen, Hecuba, and her daughter-in-law, Hector's wife, Andromache, for Hecuba was ended. Crouched on the ground, she saw the Greek ships getting ready, and she watched the city burn. Troy is no longer, she told herself, and I, who am I, a slave man, uh, a slave men drive like cattle, an old gray woman that has no home. What sorrow is there that is not mine, country lost and husband and children, glory of all my house brought low. And the women around her answered, We stand at the same point of pain. We are two slaves. Our children are crying. Call to us with tears. Mother, I am all alone. To the dark ships, now they drive me, and I cannot see you, mother. One woman still had her child. Under Mecca, held in her arms her son, Astyanax, the little boy who had once shrunk back from his father's high-crested helmet. He is young, she thought. They will let me take him with me. But from the Greek camp, a herald came to her and spoke faltering words. He told her that she must not hate him for the news he brought to her against his will. Her son, she broke in, not that he does not go with me. He answered, the boy must die, be thrown down from the towering wall of Troy. 
Now, now, let it be done, endure, like a brave woman, think. You are alone, one woman, and a slave, and no help anywhere. She knew what he said was true. There was no help. She said goodbye to her child, weeping, my little one, there, there. You can not know what waits for you. How will it be, falling down, down, all broken, and none to pity? Kiss me never again. Come closer, closer. Your mother, who bore you, put your arms around my neck. Now kiss me lips to lips. You know, uh, before modern times, they tended to have different connotations. Um, I mean, it, there's not the sexual uh, feeling in the physical sense, so if people don't make that association. Um, the soldiers carried him away just before they threw him from the wall. They had killed on Achilles' grave a young girl, Echaba's daughter, Polyxena, with the death of Hector's son. Troy's last sacrifice was accomplished. The woman waiting for the ships watched the end. Troy has perished, the great city. Only the red flame now lives there. The dust is rising, spreading out like a great wing of smoke, and all is hidden. We now are gone, one here, one there, and Troy is gone forever. Farewell, dear city, farewell, my country, where my children lived. There below, the Greek ships wait. 